Hello, and welcome to Ridgefield and Fairfield County's Native Populations, Episode 3. My name is Kate Moser Tickey, and I'm a master's student at Southern Connecticut State University, and I am hoping to get my master's in library and information science in May. One semester left. All right. So today we'll be talking about the Pequot War from 1636 to 1638. Um, technically, it's not directly connected to Ridgefield, but as we will see, um, it does tie into why Ridgefield can come to be later on. So, um, so if you look at the contemporary sources about the Pequot War, it's a little bit confusing, a little murky as to how it started. And there's also a debate over the reasons for the conflict, whether it was land and religion or trade and power. Um, there is definitely a lean in historians towards the trade and power um, that the English wanted to maintain their trade and power in Southern Connecticut. So, so what was going on? In the 1620s and 1630s, settlers had definitely been disrupting native life. Um, so in 1618 and 19, there was a smallpox epidemic that actually they believed killed out 75% of the Southern New England Algonquin population, which means Connecticut, Massachusetts, all of this area. Um, they, yeah, the settlers had been disrupting native life, also not only bringing disease, but trade, they brought guns, they were affecting land boundaries. Um, even the Mohegans um, from our, the other side of the state, they would, they cite pressure from the rapidly expanding European settlements. Um, while disease was decimating Indian populations at an alarming rate. So I mean, this really caused some problems for the natives. Um, and it wasn't too easy for the colonists either at the time, but we'll see that in a moment. So among the natives, not only were they being killed out by disease, um, there was also some turmoil among the Pequots and their subsidiary bands. So we all know the name Uncas and we know Mohegans today. We have the Pequots and the Mohegans. So the Mohegans were originally a subsidiary tribe of the Pequots. Um, and at this time there was, Uncas was a little unsure and he at this time he split um, about how to deal with the English people. In the colonists, um, yeah, they weren't doing so well either. Um, if you look back, you'll notice most of the original colonists and pilgrims were not farmers, they were merchants, so they didn't know what they were doing. And so uh, by the mid 1630s, they were dealing with some serious environmental stress and scarcity. Also a great hurricane came through the colonies in 1635, destroying the harvest. So that didn't help. Um, and new immigrants were still, people were still coming in. So things were very stressful in the colonies at the time. As we move on to the 1630s, um, we see in 1633 that the Dutch signed a treaty with the Pequots to build a trading post at Woodby Hartford. So we're starting to move into Connecticut. Um, and they did that because they were threatened by the English moving into the area. They wanted to make their claims on the land. <clears throat> And also in the 1630s, there was also a lot of intertribal warfare. So the Pequots and their Narragansetts were known for having a rivalry. They were the kind of two most powerful and influential indigenous groups in the area. Um, so because of all this power shifting in the early 1600s, Pequots had recently gained control of the, what's now the Connecticut coastal area on the Long Island Sound. And the Narragansetts didn't necessarily like the control they had over trade. So trouble starts though with this new Dutch settlement. So the Pequots killed some Narragansetts on their way to this um, trade post and settlement. And so then the Dutch decide, okay, well, we need to punish them. So they take a Pequot sachem for ransom. He is returned dead. So the Pequots kill John Stone in retaliation. Um, and then to them, that's done. That's it. Like they are one for one equal, the natives, they consider that taken care of. The settlers, not so much. Um, so things are already getting a little rocky. And then in 1636, John Oldham is killed on Block Island by natives, which launches an attack by the settlers on Block Island. So they take a huge uh, expedition. It was called the Massachusetts Bay Punitive Expedition. and they attack Block Island and the survivors of Block Island flee to the Pequots in New London. So the Pequots 
kind of take the Block Island native side and they start raiding European settlements. Um, and in this way, the English claimed that the Pequots had started this and raised the stakes. Um, and I mean, the Pequots, yeah, they're, they're not happy with what's, what's happening. So, thus we have the Pequot War. Here we have a timeline of the war um, and a map showing you some nice where everyone was, where Mason marched. Um, so winter 1636 to 1637, they, that's where they were, um, the natives were raiding our settlements and one of was a siege against Osaybrook Fort and then they attacked Weathersfield. And then the settlers attacked Mystic Fort. Uh, natives run towards the Northeast. There's a battle there. There's not much information known about that. Um, and then more survivors go down the, go down the coast to the Fairfield battle, uh, Fairfield Swamp where there's the battle of Munacomic Swamp. Um, and it officially is cited as ending in August 1637 in Dover Stone Church in Dover Plains, New York, um, which we will get to. So yeah, the Battle of Mystic Fort in May of 1637 was seen as the peak of the war. <clears throat> so it was led by Captain John Mason um, and there are Indian acts of which I should might, uh, might add, there are at least a hundred Mohegans fighting on the side of the colonists. That's according to one researcher. And Mason though, a contemporary at the time, he counted about 500 fighting on their side, mostly Mohegans. So Mason and the English and their Indian allies surround the uh, fort so that no one can escape and they burn it down. And it's estimated that about 400 to 700 natives died. Um, and that depends on the source used, but researchers actually generally think it's towards the higher number. And this was pretty much Everybody in the fort, um, it was full of women, children, and older people, people who were non-combatants. Um, and some people do escape, but uh, and they escape down to the coast. Uh, and this is an engraving in the slide of, from 1638 of the attack on the Pequot fort. So as you can see, like it showing that they're surrounding with the circular image and the circular design, um, showing that the settlers are surrounding it and there was no way for them to get out. And this is seen as a terrible toll on the mystic. It basically destroys the Pequot people. Um, as they say, they called it needless English brutality, uh, which is true. I mean, men, women, and children, were, men, women, children, everybody was in that fort. So after that, where pe the Pequots ran, some went to the Northeast, uh, where there was a battle in June of 1937. Not much is known about that battle, um, but they know that it did destroy the Pequot power. They also know that the survivors then with Sassacus, their leader moved down to Fairfield. All right, so Battle of Monocomic Swamp in July 19, or 1637, my apologies. Um, interestingly, there was actually just an archeological dig done um, on the swamp fight uh, in it at, by the Fairfield History Museum and Mashantucket Pequot with the NPS service, much like Richfield's grant coming up. And you can find out more about that on their website. But so only about 12 are killed here in this swamp fight. And what happens is, is that um, they leave Saybrook Fort, the uh, English and their allies, and they follow them. They actually take a ship down to New Haven and they heard reports and they followed them down the coast here to Fairfield. I'm in Fairfield right now. Um, and they surrounded them around a swamp. It turned out the Pequots had actually fled to a tributary tribe, the Saska, Sasqua, um, that were in the swamp here. Um, and they were seeking basically asylum. And the English allied forces attempted to surround the swamp um, and fired into the swamp. Um, the next day using diversionary tactics the Pequot were able to escape, um, but it really was the end of the Pequots as a fighting force. They were not able to gather this much power or men at one place to be able to do this again. But uh, Sasuke had actually left the group when they, when they were on their way to Fairfield and he has gone north. And so he was intercepted and killed at 
Dover Stone Church, which is a rock formation in Dover Plains, New York. Um, and that's why it's listed as the final battle. So he had left to go probably find some other allies. Uh, and he, they think he was killed by Mohicans. They're not totally sure, it's a little gray, but um, all they know is that Sassacus was no more at this point. So in 1638, the war is considered done and we signed the Treaty of Hartford. So the Treaty of Hartford is signed in September of 1638. Uh, so there's a few months delay there, you know, things back then happened a little slow, but uh, English letters, uh, settlers in the New York uh, connect colonies of Wethersfield and Hartford, the Narragansetts were there and the Mohegans. The Pequot tribe was notably absent. So they had no say in what this treaty did to them, which was many things. Uh, first, it stripped the Pequot identity and lands, so the Pequot name could no longer be used. Uh, it enslaved former Pequots to both English and other Indian tribes. And it basically described Pequot land as now English land, which is where they're saying it's more about trade and power because the English did this to keep this land. So those Pequots are given to Mohegans and Narragansetts because they both helped, those two tribes both helped the English. <clears throat> um, and it was also to guarantee, it was trying to keep peace between the Mohegans and Narragansetts because as we know, they were a little bit of rivals. But, so, and it also, by doing this, by the way they worded the treaty, it also, yes, made the English sovereign over the land and bound the natives to the English. And in 1637 also, right, right before this treaty, they actually enacted the first bounty, the head bounty ever in America, they think, um, on Pequots. And they were basically tracked down all over like Westchester County and Fairfield counties and the rest of Connecticut um, and killed, hunted down and killed for, and a bunch of natives of their rival tribes really took advantage of that. So we see more decimation of the Pequot people even after the war is over. And that those continued until 1641, so for three years. Um, so the, the Pequots who were enslaved were given to the Mohegans and Narragansetts. Uh, and then P P P Mohegans, I'm sorry, ended up, doing well in this conflict because they were seen later or afterwards by the English as allies because um, they had been helped. So though it would help the Mohegans in some ways, their, the English's favoritism towards them would cause some issues later on. But altogether, they had thought that the English had thought they had secured a peace, um, that Southern New England was safe, um, ready to settle, and there were gonna be no more problems. But um, what it did though is actually sets an uneasy peace. So about 25% of the population had been killed and 75% dispersed. So as they were given to the Pequ the Pequots were given to Mohegans and Niantics, other natives, they weren't so much interested in destroying Pequot identity. Um, some were sold down to slavery in the Caribbean, uh, but that was a minority. Uh, some were given to soldiers in their service, such as my ancestor, actually Dennison, George Dennison. He had an indentured native after one of the wars. Um, he loved them. So the thing is, is that there were still hundreds of surviving Pequots all around. They, they are still there and they do consider themselves Pequots, even though legally they're not supposed to. Um, and then after 1638, there are still conflicts in the area. Thus, the Mohegans and Narragansetts, they fight over the Pequot survivors and the trade with the English. Connecticut and Massachusetts fight over the land that was uh, freed up. And Massachusetts and the Narragansetts are going back and forth because they want the same agreement that was got in Connecticut because Massachusetts didn't sign the Treaty of Hartford and Massachusetts wasn't uh, <laughs> too keen on that one. They were busy trying to fight over the land that today would become Connecticut and try and make it part of their colony. Um, so all in all though, many of these issues and these tensions and conflicts continue to rise until 1637 when English are pretty much dominant in the region and the natives try to do something about that. But that's for the next episode. Um, it should be also noted that under Robin Custin, I can't say his name, 
um, that under the Sachem, Elyang Sachem in 1666, they were able to reestablish themselves. So it wasn't too success, the war wasn't successful in decimating the people, as we know today, because the Pequot tribe still exists. But yeah, so um, next episode, we'll explore King Philip's War and see how they came to that. But so if you're still more interested in the Pequot War, there are a lot of good resources out there these days. Um, Pequotwar.org, that's about the battlefield research. Um, there's a great article by Dr. Kevin McBride and Lori, who is actually over here at the Fairfield Museum and History Center. And that's from Connecticut Explored. Mash and Tucket is just a wealth of information. There's a many sites and on any of these here would be really good. So thank you so much for listening today.